Hi, welcome back. Um, we have a bit more formal uh, groups left. Um, so remember what we've been doing, and I'll tell you where we're going with this. Uh, we've defined formal groups, and uh, to each formal group, we have a, a local rank, so a complete local rank with a maximal ideal M, then we've attached a formal group F of M, uh, where here, uh, the addition on two elements uh, and the maximal ideal of the of the local ring is defined. Remember, it's just x uh, plus y is defined to be instead of the addition, just the natural addition as elements of the ring, the the addition that comes from R. Instead of that one, we say f of x y. Okay, and then we get a different group uh, with that structure. And uh, we're interested in those because, in particular, we know that there is a formal group attached to an elliptic curve. And that it's going to allow us to say things about uh, the points, the piatic points on elliptic curves. Great. So, uh, an important result that we proved last time is the following um, that uh, this result right here that every torsion element has an order a power of p. So uh, there is no uh, prime to p uh, elements, okay? Um, and uh, that's that's one part of what we want to show. Um, there are two parts we want to show that uh, what we've already shown, that the elements uh, of, um, one second, please. back. So we have shown that um, there are no elements of order prime to p. And now we what, what we want to show is that if there are elements that are a power of p, the order a power of p, then we want to put a bound on that. We're going to show that in many cases there are none, or uh, the power of p, it cannot be p to the 127, it might be just p or p squared, depending on uh, where we're living, okay, and depending on the extension. But it's going to give us some um, some bound on that. Okay, so uh, we also proved uh, we also defined the invariant differential. Uh, there it is, and out of the invariant differential, we proved a result, which is we didn't prove it actually. I uh, I didn't I skipped that part, uh, but the key is that uh, the multiplication by p map it can actually always be decomposed as uh, elements as coefficients that are a multiple of p plus, if the coefficient is not a multiple of p, then the power is a multiple of p. Okay, the power in the exponent, uh, the exponent of the monomial is a power, is a multiple of p. Okay, so we're going to use that. And finally, we, uh, we define the formal logarithm. The formal logarithm is just the integral of the invariant differential. And uh, because this, um, we uh, we are using a normalized invariant differential. It starts with one times t plus dot 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 dot. dot. We had shown that those uh, have a unique inverse. Such a power series a unique inverse, and that unique inverse is what we call the uh, the formal exponential. Okay, and we gave uh, last time I believe a couple of examples of what's the log and what's exponential for the multiplicative formal group. Great. So. Uh, let's get started then uh, with the following proposition. So uh, one consequence of the uh, of the logarithm is that it's actually an isomorphism of formal groups uh, to an additive formal group. So if you have a formal group F over R, and we're going to assume that the characteristic of R uh, is zero, then the logarithm um, from f, so the formal logarithm to the additive formal group is an isomorphism of formal groups over k, which is r tensor q, the, the fraction field of r. <clears throat> 
okay? And here's the proof. Uh, so let omega be uh, the formal logarithm, uh, the, sorry, the formal invariant differential, which um, uh, remember that the property that defines this is that it's invariant, invariant with respect to addition, so that omega of FTS is the same differential that omega of T. Okay, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to integrate with respect to T both sides of this equation. Okay, and um, since I have an equality, well, on the left hand side, what I get is uh, the logarithm of um, FTS, uh, it's the logarithm of uh, uh, of just T, uh, plus, of course, don't forget the plus C, right? When you integrate uh, this these formal integrals, uh, we're going to have a constant of integration. In this case, it's a constant, but since I'm integrating with respect to T, the constant can depend on S. Okay, so the constant of integration um, has, let's call it plus C, but it depends on S. All right. And um, now, so for, for some constant of integration. And that constant of integration uh, would be uh, in the fraction field of R, because there might be, you know, there might be denominators as I'm uh, integrating, I'm introducing denominators. Uh, and, but it's a power series in S with coefficients in K. And uh, evaluate, if I evaluate all the uh, expression at T equals zero, what do I get? Uh, what I get is that the constant of integration is um, the logarithm uh, uh, Um, on one hand, I'm going to get, so uh, when I evaluate at, at zero, remember that the logarithm, the formal logarithm starts with T, okay? It's T plus the dot, 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 dot. Uh, so definitely this is zero. So let me, let me rewrite this actually as um, the log of f zero s plus uh, um, equal log of zero plus c of s and uh, this is zero uh, because the power series starts with t okay uh, remember that the logarithm uh, in the example that we saw in the formal multiplicative group it corresponds to log of one plus t. It's not log of x as in, in the real numbers. It's log of one plus t. So at zero, it's not undefined. At zero is sort of like log of one, which is zero. Okay. Um, so anyway, it, it starts with, the, if you think of, uh, about it in terms of power series, it starts with t. So the log of zero is zero. And uh, f of zero s by the properties of the formal group, that's uh, just s. So, okay. quick so, question uh, on one, that. One second, let me finish okay. yeah, of course. here. So this is just F of zero S by the properties of the formal group is S. And then what this implies is that the constant of integration is log of F of S. And uh, then coming back to uh, this equation, oops, I didn't mean that uh, sake of a thing. Uh, coming back to this equation, um, what this says is that uh, the log of FTS is the log of T plus the log of S. So it is a um, uh, it is a hom. Yes, uh, Ben. 
Yeah, so whenever we talk about power series in this context, we're going to be talking about power series with non-zero constant. That's one of the reasons that we would write the exponential function, the formal exponential function is e to the t minus one. So we get rid of that constant term. Is that how we should be thinking about it? Yes. So, I mean, you could think about power series with a constant function, but the, all the power series that appear in this setting mm -hmm. start with a... Uh, um, it, it, they start with a the constant function is zero yeah. um, because well you have the formal uh, addition and the formal addition we want it to be f of x y x plus y mm -hmm. so that already has a zero constant term uh, you want uh, isomorphisms that, or the homs are power series that eventually you want f composed with g to be t to be the identity. Uh, so not mm -hmm. one, but to be T. So they have to start with a non-zero constant term, otherwise that's not going to work out. Um, the formal logarithm, again, we also want it to be sort of like shifted um, so that it corresponds to log of one plus T because uh, remember that what's happening here is that we're talking about, we want to evaluate it at units. Mm -hmm. I mean, um, at the opposite we want to evaluate it at elements of the maximal ideal yeah. so um then when you evaluate the logarithm at a unit is going to be the units in this local setting are one plus something in the maximal ideal so my, might as well define the function already to be log of one plus something in the maximal ideal so the function is a function of something in the maximal ideal and instead of log of one plus t we are thinking of log of t meaning that we're going to evaluate log of one plus t eventually. Yeah. Okay. That, that all makes sense. sense. Yeah. That makes okay. a lot of sense. Thank you so much. All right. So what we've proved here is the log, the formal log, is a hum, and we have a uh, we have a formal uh, inverse, and the exponential uh, is uh, the inverse. And therefore, uh, log is uh, an isomorphism of formal groups. Okay. So, depending how you look at this, uh, this proposition says that all of a sudden the formal groups are very boring. With the, with the logarithm, you can make them all be just the additive formal group. Okay. However, this doesn't mean that this logarithm is going to converge in the entire formal group, right? So now we are going to have to worry about issues of convergence. Uh, what happens when do we actually have a convergence? So when I do not formal groups, but the group is associated to a formal group, when is this map going to converge to give me a homomorphism? And then the inverse function, the exponential, when is that going to converge to give me an inverse function that is going to give me an isomorphism between the two groups as I said to the formal group? Okay, so um, uh, so here, well, one, one factoid about uh, how bad can the denominator be in the logarithm, which helps with the convergence is the following. Um, not going to prove that I think it's 5.5 uh, in the book. Not going to prove this one, but um, let R be of a characteristic zero and uh, let F be a formal group. Uh, then, uh, then it turns out that the logarithm of the formal logarithm is an expression of the form at worst is of this form with numerators being in the ring, in the in the ring of integers, and the exponential, because um well, I mean, you know why the log is like that, because it's the integral of the invariant differential. The invariant differential is a power series in R. When you integrate at most, you get n's, and the inverse of that at most you get n factorials in the denominator okay uh, for some a n b n in r and a1 b1 being one 
okay so uh what this tells you this sort of like comes out of like you integrate and then try to find the inverse function to that and you would see that that's the worst it can be uh that, that they are of that form and that is going to tell us something about like when do they converge all right so now uh, what we're going to talk is about uh formal groups uh groups uh, over dvrs uh, which are being a complete um, so remember that dvr Uh, discrete valuation rank is um, a rank R with a uh, valuation, uh, so a valuation is um, uh, new that uh, goes from K is a ring R, R uh, with a uh, fraction field. Uh, whoops, fraction field K. Um, that goes to uh, well, the integers and And infinity uh, such that uh, the part of this discrete means uh, because the values are in the integers that uh, the discreteness part of it, um, the valuation uh, of an element is infinity if and only if uh, the element is x, uh, the element is zero, um, the valuation of x times y is the valuation of X plus the valuation of Y and, um, and the valuation of X plus Y is greater or equal to the minimum of the valuation of X and the valuation of Y uh, with equality uh, if uh, the valuation of X is not the valuation of Y. If the valuation of x is the valuation of y, it could be an inequality. Okay, so um, in our setting, we have R, um, for example, in our setting, when we have R a complete um, with respect to its maximal ideal, M, uh, then, um, then you can pick, for example, the, the valuation of X to be, uh, what is it, the largest, largest integer such that X is in um, M to the D for something in R and then extend, um, extend to the fractions with the, uh, the valuation of X over Y is so the valuation of X minus valuation of Y. Okay, so uh, that is, uh, so our complete local rings, uh, our complete local rings are discrete valuation rings, but this, what I'm talking about now, it can be done a little bit more generally. Uh, generally, if you have a, a discrete valuation. Um, so go back to our setting where now we have um, a formal group over a DVR. And uh, and we have a formal group attached to it. And remember that uh, this has uh, no torsion uh, of order prime to P, uh, P being the characteristic of the residue field. Okay, so now what we want to uh, what what would we want to do? Our goal is to study the study the uh, the p primary torsion. Okay. 
All right. Um, so first, uh, what I said, we actually need to know when does the logarithm and the exponential converge in a discrete valuation ring. And this is given by the following lemma. Uh, the following lemma says that if R is of characteristic zero and, uh, and is complete uh, with respect to its valuation uh, new, Okay, uh, P is prime and um, the valuation of P is bigger than zero. P here is then the, um, the residue, uh, the characteristic of the residue field. Um, so have, uh, first of all, A, if I have a power series of the form, any power series of the form, uh, a n over n t to the n such as the logarithm uh, with the a n's in the ring of integers and the valuation of x is bigger than zero, then uh, f of x converges uh, to an element of r. Okay. Uh, you can. Um, You can try to think of why that is, but it's essentially basic calculus that uh, uh, exponents uh, be polynomials, okay? Uh, and that the valuation of uh, whatever n is, uh, is going to have, um, so uh, the valuation of x to the n is going to be, eventually it's gonna be, be whatever the valuation of n is. Uh, enough that it's going to end up converging. I don't want to get into issues of convergence, but um, that's uh, how it converges. But it just tells you that as long as um, as long as x, for example, in our setting, x is in maximal ideal, then the logarithm converges. Perfect. Okay. How about the exponential? So uh, an exponential. So for example any power series of the form of this form uh, with bn in the uh, in the ring of integers and uh, b1 uh, non-zero uh, then what happens is that if the valuation of x is bigger than the valuation of p over p minus one then uh, g of x converges uh, in R. And moreover, uh, the valuation of the, of the limit is the valuation of x, okay? So now you don't have that uh, this converges for the entire maximal ideal, you need to have the valuation of x to be in so or to be x to be in a sufficiently high power of the maximal ideal. Um, notice that if um, if if we're working, for example, over the key, uh, the piatics, what does this say? Uh, so, for example, if we're working over QP, uh, then we can pick our valuation. Our maximal ideal is PZP. So the valuation is just the piatic valuation. So the valuation of P is, P is in the maximum ideal. So the valuation of P is one. So um, then the exponential for a formal group, uh, the exponential in, um, the exponential will converge Uh, when uh, the valuation of X is bigger than uh, one over P minus one, okay? Um, this is 
if p is bigger than two, this is the valuation is, um, well, this is, let's see, if p is two, that's the easy one, uh, this is actually one, okay? Um, but if, if p is uh, bigger or equal to, to two, uh, bigger than two, so at least three, then this is, this is at least um, a half. Okay. Or the smallest it can be is a half when P is three. Otherwise, it's even smaller than that. Um, so this says that if P is bigger than two, this converges in uh, M. But if P is two, then the valuation has to be bigger than one, so it converges in m squared. Okay, so I don't have I have convergence for the exponential in the entire maximal ideal for p three and above, but I do not have convergence of the exponential for p uh, equals to two uh, in, in the maximal ideal. I have to go to the square. Okay. Uh, so this is going to have a consequence that what we saw before this formal group isomorphism is going to be an isomorphism of the entire formal group for p bigger than two, but not for p equals to two. We're going to have to go to the square of the maximal ideal to get an isomorphism. And what that's going to say in a moment is that there might be some um, two torsion uh, when you were talking over formal groups over QP. There might be some two torsion, but there's not going to be uh, p torsion for p bigger than two. We'll see that in a moment. Okay, so um, so here is a theorem now. So uh, let k be a field of uh, characteristic zero complete with respect to a uh, normalized um, discrete valuation uh, new, uh, that means that the valuation of K star is uh, all of the integers. Uh, let R uh, be the uh, valuation ring. Those are the elements with valuation bigger or equal to zero. Uh, M, the maximal ideal, which are the elements with valuation bigger than zero. Uh, P uh, prime uh, with a positive valuation. And uh, F over R, a formal group. And uh, part A, uh, the logarithm induces a homomorphism, not isomorphism, a homomorphism from the formal group, the group as I said to the formal group to, uh, to K, uh, which is additive. Okay, so K as an additive group, um, and um, B. Here, K is the incarnation. Um, so the, the formal group, the actual homomorphism is going into uh, G, A, hat, M, which remember is just uh, M with addition, uh, which is inside K. Okay, um, and uh, let R be an integer that is bigger than the evaluation of P over P minus one, an integer, hopefully the, the biggest, uh, the largest integer above that fraction, then log induces an isomorphism. Um, the log now is an isomorphism from the formal group 
the group attached to the rth power of the maximal ideal and uh, the formal additive group of the uh, rth power of the maximal ideal. Okay, so that's the best we can do is this because uh, the exponential map is finicky about its convergence. So uh, the proof of this first part is that the logarithm Uh, the formal group is an isomorphism uh, over K. So it's a the it's an isomorphism of formal groups, and um, and to show that it is a home, it suffices. So for A, it suffices to show uh, that log. Uh, F converges for X in the maximal ideal, and that is what the lemma says. Okay. And uh, so we have that home, and then uh, the exponential uh, also converges. Um, as long as um, the valuation is bigger than uh, that number. And that gives me uh, the isomorphism that I was looking for. Okay, very good. Now, um, right, so now, we are ready to prove what we wanted about the P torsion. Uh, let me first uh, make a remark here. Um, is that um, if R is bigger than um, that, that number, then uh, what we get is an isomorphism. So I get that this is isomorphic uh, to the formal additive group. Um, but in this case, this is torsion free. This is just isomorphic to the rth power of the maximal ideal, and that there is no torsion there, that's just a torsion free module. Okay, so this is torsion free. Uh, and that implies that. Um, at least this much is torsion free. Okay. So if there is any torsion is in the uh, lower powers of the maximal idea. Great. So now finally, here is uh, what I actually uh, wanted to show from the beginning is this theorem. Theorem says the following. This is theorem 6.1 in the book, and it says the following uh, let R uh, be uh, DVR uh, with uh, maximal ideal M and P the characteristic of uh, the residue field. Uh, then uh, let um, the formal group. One second, please. Let's see. Um, Okay, so we have a formal group. We have a form the group associated to the formal group. Take an element of the of that group. This is of exact order uh, p to the n. 
for n bigger or equal to one. Okay, so suppose we have an element of exact order p to the n. Um, so that means that p to the n x is zero and p to the n minus one of x is not zero. Uh, then the valuation of x has to be less or equal to the valuation of p over uh, p to the n minus p to the n minus one. Okay, so um, again, from the example we had before, like an example we had before, if R is ZP and P is big or equal to three, then uh, the valuation of X has to be less or equal to the valuation of P over P to the N minus P to the N minus one, which is uh, less or equal to a half. Okay. Um, but um, then that that doesn't that that says that there is no torsion at all, because uh, if so, uh, we also have the the evaluation. But if x is in the maximal ideal, then the evaluation of x is bigger or equal to one. Okay, uh, is um, bigger or equal to one, then therefore uh, there is nothing there. So no, no torsion. No uh, torsion. Okay, so um, very good. So, um, so here, M being PZP, then the valuation is at least, uh, if it's a multiple of P, then the valuation is one. Uh, and therefore, uh, there is not going to be torsion. When P is two, however, uh, we are going to be able to see some torsion, uh, and then we will we will get back to that in a moment. All right. So here is um, uh, here's the proof of the theorem. So uh, again, uh, what we we want to show is that uh, if X is of exact order uh, p to the n, uh, then the valuation of x is less or equal to the valuation of p over p to the n minus p to the n minus one. This, by the way, what it says is that over qp, for example, there is not going to be much torsion, but as you go up in extensions of qp, then the valuation of p might grow. Um, so if you if you grow in an extension where there is ramification at p, the valuation of p might grow, and then there might be a room for torsion to fit in. Okay, but that says that, for example, that you have to go up in extensions that are ramified to be able to see uh, some torsion happening. Okay, so um, um, so again, we have uh, our Ring R of characteristic um, of characteristic zero. Oops. And uh, P the characteristic of the residue field. And um, we're going to do an induction on N. Uh, when N is one, Remember that multiplication by P uh, can be decomposed as P times F of T plus G of T to the P and uh, F of T and uh, G of T evaluated at zero is zero. They both start with, uh, with, the, uh, with a constant term T. And in fact, uh, f of t uh, will start with t plus higher order terms because remember that, um, so recall 
that multiplication by p actually starts by uh, p times t plus the dot, right? Plus higher order terms. That's something else we prove. The multiplication by m starts with m times t. That also we prove by induction. Okay, so now suppose that multiplication by p times x uh, is zero. So x is a point of order p, um, an exact order p, and x is non-zero. Then uh, we have that uh, zero, I'm going to get zero uh, p times f of x plus g of x to the p is zero. And uh, this is uh, p times x plus uh, higher order terms in x uh, plus g of x to the p. And because uh, it is a, a DVR, uh, the valuations of the two, if I'm going to get zero, the valuations of the two have to uh, match. Okay. So, um, the, the valuation of this term and this term have to match so that they cancel out uh, to get me zero, okay? Uh, so evaluation and moreover, um, the valuation of P of X is the valuation of the uh, first term, whoops, sorry, of g x to the p, uh, right? The the evaluation. So we also have remember that the evaluation of a sum is the evaluation of. Um, uh, so also recall. But the valuation of x plus y is bigger or equal to the minimum of the valuation of x uh, valuation of y and on the on this side here i have uh, p times x plus p times say x squared p times x cubed all those because the valuation of x is bigger than zero are going to have larger valuations than the first term which is px so I have to have the devaluation, uh, I didn't write it here, uh, the valuations need to match. And now uh, the valuation on this side, the minimum is the valuation of Px, which is this, and then it has to match the valuation of the first term of G of X to the P because also, um, as I get higher powers of X in there, those terms are going to have higher valuations as well. So the very first term is the one that has going to have the least valuation. So there's an equality of those two valuations, the valuation of PX and the valuation of the first term of G X uh, to the P. And uh, what that tells me is then that the valuation of PX is bigger or equal to the valuation of x to the p. It might not be equal because it might not be the very first term, it might not be x to the p, it might be uh, x to the 2p, or there might be a p in the in the constant term of in the um, in the first term of the power series of g x to the p. Okay, but what I do know is that the valuation of p to the x is bigger or equal to the valuation of x to the p. And now, because of the properties of the valuation, this is the valuation of P plus the valuation of X. And on the other side, this is the uh, P times the valuation of X. And if you rearrange, uh, solve for the valuation of P here, this says that the valuation of P is bigger or equal to P minus one uh, valuation of X. And, uh, and therefore, uh, the valuation of X is uh, less or equal to the valuation of p over p minus one. Okay, that proves the uh, the base case. So now let me do the induction step. So now for the induction step, 
I want to prove that if it is true for n, it is true for n plus one. So uh, let x uh, be of order p to the n plus one. Then um, p times x is of order p to the n. But if it is of order p to the n, then I know by the induction hypothesis, okay, so here I'm using the induction hypothesis. I know that the result is true there. So this is bigger or equal to um, um, nu of p over p to the n minus p to the n minus one. Right, because px is of order p to the n now. And uh, on the other hand, this is, I can use my decomposition of multiplication by p again. This is nu of p times f of x uh, plus g x to the p. And again, the same reasoning as before, this is bigger or equal to uh, the minimum, the valuation of uh, each one. Uh, of the smallest terms in each one of these uh, summons. So uh, the, the minimum of the valuation of px or the valuation of x to the p. Okay. Um, suppose first uh, that the minimum happens at uh, here. So the minimum is going to happen here or here, right? So suppose uh, that if the minimum is nu of px, then the equation above reads that the valuation of p over p to the n minus p to the n minus one is bigger or equal to the valuation of px, which in turn, is valuation of p plus valuation of x. And um, um, uh, oh, yeah. Yeah, that, that is that is impossible, right? Because then this is saying that uh, what is this saying? Since uh, this is positive, then this is saying that the valuation of p is smaller than a fraction of the valuation of p, right? This is um, th this is smaller than the valuation of p, so the valuation of p is smaller. Uh, uh, the valuation of p is bigger than the valuation of p plus something positive. Okay, so that is uh, that is a contradiction right there. The valuation of p is bigger than the valuation of p plus something positive. Uh, that leads to that contradiction. Okay, so the minimum must happen on the other side. So uh, this minimum, if it was here, I'm unhappy. So hopefully I need to be happy that it has to be on this side um, that uh, the minimum is uh, uh, the equation then reads that the valuation of P over P to the N minus P to the N minus one must be bigger or equal to the valuation of X to the P, which is uh, P times the valuation of X. And if I divide by P, then what I get to the valuation of X is less or equal to the valuation of P over P to the N plus one minus P to the N, uh, which is I, what I wanted to prove in the induction. Therefore, that is by induction, the principle of induction, um, the result follows. Okay. And uh, that's what we wanted to prove, that now we have um, this result about the portion. Uh, let me just check that I don't have anything else left over. Okay. 
here. I think we are ready to go into uh, local fields. So I'm going to stop here and then we'll just continue next time um, with um, ellipticers or local fields. Now that we have the result again, uh, this was the, the result we were after is this, that uh, this gives me a bound on the valuation of points of, um, of order uh, a power order and a uh, power of P. And we know that the elements of uh, that in F of M, there is no elements of order that is um, prime to P. Okay, so those two things we're gonna put together over local fields now to uh, back to study elliptic curves. I'll stop there.